Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's phenomenal video featuring the contents of this probably rather familiar looking box. This is the same box that the Bandmaster featured in the last video was delivered in. I sent it back to him in this box. He was so pleased with the Bandmaster that he sent us a second uh, very unusual device to work on. I think you're going to get a real kick out of uh, watching this one get repaired and tested. I know that Mitzi the Wonder Cat who has been putting on a few pounds as you notice here um, will join us and help us. She's been sniffing the box and she has given it uh, her Dew Claws thumbs up. Okay so let's get it open and see what's inside. First we got the tubes and I don't know maybe the old original cord that's been removed we've got our letter that we'll read in just a minute but now the grand reveal a blackface Fender 6G15 freestanding reverb unit those of you who have been watching my videos for many years uh, know that I uh, actually built one of these years ago from scratch. It was one of my very early home-built projects and uh, I made a video about it, I don't know, a couple years ago and now we have a chance to check out an absolutely mint original version of it. This is probably from around 1965 or 66 it was bought at the same time as the Bandmaster was and it's a one owner unit the man who uh, sent the Bandmaster and it bought them in 1966 and has kept them ever since and look at the condition of this jewel now we'll go all through it that's my standard procedure but for now let's take a look at the outside You know, this really isn't grill cloth, it's solid here. The um, reverb tank is mounted vertically on the back of this wall, but this is solid. Got the beautiful Fender logo, perfect Tolex, properly aged fittings on the ends of the handle. Handle's perfect. Let me turn it around so we can get a look at the rear and at the control panel. Looks like we have several gift wrapped surprises that came in the box. Uh, Missy is showing an uncanny sniffing ability here. I'm guessing the one that she's picked there, let's open it and see. It may be the kitty treats. Okay, boy she's having a field day with that one. What do you think, Mitz? Let's open it and see. Looks like we've got a set of three catnip mice and she's showing a definite weakness for catnip much like has been Jack's downfall being hooked on it look at this well she's loving those little mice oh that's hilarious what a cutie what a fine workshop cat I mean, come on gets no better than this good girl I'm curious what the other two packages contain. Let's open them up and see. <laughs> oh, that's rich. Looks like the second gift is for your old uncle, Nancy. Some original recipe smoked shorty sausages. And I'm going to open it up and have a little snack. But then we've got one more gift to open. Wow, Mitzi really enjoys that toy. I've never seen her play with toys. Who would have thought an outdoor you know, feral cat would enjoy little toys that much? Robert seemed to know. Now, most of the time, uh, the owners will send me just the chassis uh, to work on. In this case, I asked the owner to send the entire unit because after seeing pictures of this I wanted to share with you just the pristineness of it um, 
I've never seen one quite this nice. Uh, these aren't all that common, not the early ones like this. They made a reissue, but um, as you can see, this one has been very well cared for. I'll put a link in the video description showing the videos that I have posted that relate to this unit. Uh, I also uh, have posted a modified schematic to help you build your own as well as other like engineering drawings uh, to help you with the uh, chassis and cabinet and things of that sort. So if you'd like to build your own because one like this is going to cost a fortune. I'm assuming over a thousand dollars. But you can build your own for probably uh, less than half of that. Okay, so uh, let's pull the back and take a look inside. All right, before I pull the back door, which is now all unscrewed, I uh, wanted to run down the control panel. Okay, um, some of the things speak for themselves. Uh, notice only a three-quarter amp fuse. Fairly simple circuit, basic circuit, sort of like a champ circuit. But instead of driving a speaker, we're going to drive a reverb tank. Uh, and I'll go over the schematic with you, and we'll cover all of the aspects of it. But it doesn't draw a lot of current. So only a three-quarter amp fuse. Going to have three white knobs on this one. On the early, the black face, um, I believe, uh, were the ones that had the white knobs, and then they went to a regular black knobs later. But in uh, the dwell, that's the duration of the reverb effect. Uh, it's going to start out strong and then taper off to nothing. Now, that length of time can be three or four seconds, depending on the type of reverb tank that you use. This will either compress that down to a very short dwell, it, which would really almost be just a simple echo, to a really long kind of surf music type of dwell. Very important control. The mixer, as we'll see, this unit is going to split your guitar signal into two different signals. One of them is going to be called the dry signal. That's simply the guitar output with no modification. The wet signal is going to be the one sent th through the reverb tank. After that happens, after they're split up, one is dry, one is wet, they're going to come through. This controls the ratio. Lots of wet to a little bit of dry, lots of dry to a little bit of wet. You can see how that would be very helpful. You crank it all the way up and it's all wet, if you pardon the expression. All the way down it would be all dry. Okay, now tone is exactly the way it is on a guitar amplifier. Now, reverb works best with treble frequencies. Bass frequencies cause it grief. It gets kind of noisy and uh, flubby. Uh, so, really, the signal that's going to be coming in here, we'll see, is primarily treble signal. We're going to filter out the bass. But this will give you some control over how treble the treble is, if you will. Okay, so uh, I will demonstrate each of these controls later when we demonstrate the unit, and you'll see how they work. We'll also go through the schematic to show how each of these controls function. Okay, so, uh, and you see that we have a uh, input from the guitar, output to the amplifier. There is no real uh, amplifier here, no power amp in this. So you have to, this is sort of like a big glorified pedal, you have to then take your output and go into an amplifier to uh, drive your speakers. Okay, let's pull the back and take a look at the inside. Okay, I just want to take a second here to show the inside of the back door. I don't think I've ever seen one where all the little uh, flaps of Tolex were glued down like this. This is the way it looked, I think, when it left the factory. It's incredible. I've just had a string of just fabulous uh, amps and uh, other equipment here to work on, and I hope we don't start taking stuff like this for granted because this is rare as hen's teeth in this type of condition. It's going to give us a chance to go back in time to like 1965, which is what, 47 years ago. To see exactly how Fender built this, how marked it,
type of components they used, everything. It's a really nice chance to uh, review a historic piece of equipment. Okay, I pulled the back door and we have the original two-prong power cord and we have the cables by which the reverb tank, which is under here, mounted vertically on the face of the cabinet, the rear inside surface of the face. And you'll see that the tank right here is suspended by fairly stout springs so that it can move away from that front wall or move forward up much closer to it. We'll see that there are rubber uh, kind of bumpers that are attached to the rear of that front panel so that when you push the tank when you th these screws are real tight right now but when you push the the handle forward you're gonna push the tank up against those rubber bumpers and cage the springs to keep them from thrashing around and damaging the transducers so to transport the unit you would push this forward mash that tank up against the rubber bumpers and carry it without any concern for damaging the transducers then when it's time to play you'd pull back on this handle the tank would move away from the rubber bumpers the springs then could make their reverb noise and it would work great time to pack up push the handle recage the spring okay I've lifted the case up to tilt it upwards so we can get a good look inside these are my uh, custom made 6G15 um, cabinet tilts um, I'm going to make them available on eBay shortly um, they're not going to be cheap but I think uh, we'll try to make sure they're affordable okay um, we see here the number stamped on the tank is um, what F O eighty two O six six, so a nineteen sixty six tank, and then we look in here on the chassis. Uh, looks like T one nine two O six six. So both of these date from nineteen sixty six, and I have a feeling that uh, they came together as a unit. Okay, let's look uh, at the power transformer. I've seen this before where it says uh, CSA test. Someone out there is going to tell us exactly what that means. Uh, when we're working on the, the uh, circuit, we'll go in more detail. Uh, but as you can see, we have our original uh, kind of cardboard tube capacitors, um, the blue molded caps like the, uh, filter, uh, the fender amps from this era. We have a placer to plug in our foot switch, um, tube sockets. Look at the floor of this. A little bit dusty. I'm, I'm pretty upset that there's that dust there. But other than that, no rodent droppings, no muskrat uh, bile. As we go down the line here, we see that we have the kind of standard looking uh, cathode bypass caps and their cardboard tubes. Um, I have a, a feeling I'm going to be restuffing them uh, so that we have new capacitors within these original tubes. Uh, the old blue molded caps, uh, so typical of fender amps of this era. We have here the remote foot switch jack uh, so that we can uh, turn the unit on and off remotely little diode bridge here uh, which I don't know we we'll, may replace those diodes um, I hate messing with this more than is absolutely necessary but uh, well, I think we need to open the letter to see what it is that the owner uh, specifically requests before we do let's take a look at the original tube chart fender reverb uh, model 6g15 production 46 which doesn't mean much to me but let's look at the date look they stamped it twice I've never seen that before it looks to me like they sort of missed the edge with the F um, somebody stamped it and said oh my god part of the F's gone so they restamped it P F okay and and uh, P is what the 16th letter of the alphabet so you add that to 1950 so this would be 1966 
and F is uh, what June the sixth month so June of 66 beautiful shape just like every other part of this splendid device okay let's read the letter okay here's the letter from the owner um, as you see it is indeed one owner he personally purchased it back in 1966 new uh, it's been well cared for I should say until about five years ago when it just quit reverbing well you know how frustrating that is when your amp quits amping and your reverb unit quits reverbing life is not good okay so he just threw it in a dark dank closet and said the heck with it and told just recently and he sent it to us okay um, issues a reverbs not functional two prong power cord is broken please replace he wants to plug it into the bandmaster the, that AC outlet on the back of the bandmaster um, I am sure that's just a a two prong receptacle and I'm not sure how you could have that be grounded uh, I have a way to do it uh, which I'll show you I'll have to check with him and make sure that my idea will work for him okay check the resistors uh, capacitors probably the filter caps um, tube should be good let's hope small piece of paper in the tube chart that is hanging on for dear life uh, if it's the small piece I'm thinking of uh, way back in the back corner there I'm thinking it quit hanging on so let me check all around um, in the cabinet you never can tell uh, I might be able to find it uh, there was remember a bunch of uh, kind of uh, air uh, packing material stuck into the uh, bottom here maybe static statically uh, that piece of paper was attracted we'll see okay so looks pretty straightforward I think what we need to do is make this jewel start reverbing again okay so let's get started step one or we'll remove the two Phillips head uh, screws and drop out the chassis um, I've often cursed uh, fender for not uh, making captive nuts uh, in the chassis so that you can just simply screw these in without having to position the nut under here and hold it onto the end of the uh, screw it's always a lot of fun when there's a transformer in the way okay so no captive nuts for us okay they're free as a bird well good news when I tipped the cabinet and chassis up on end to remove the second um, chassis retention screw I found I think the missing piece of the tube chart I found a little green piece of felt that's supposed to go between the caging arm and the tank to prevent vibration um, you can imagine if it's metal to metal gonna make a noise so we gotta replace that and a little piece of rubber band probably uh, what held the cord together in a bundle at one time or other now that the chassis is removed we'll get a really nice unobstructed view of the interior of the cabinet and the vertically mounted reverb tank for those of you who would like to make your own 6G15 and would like to make it just like the original I'm going to show you a special little feature here you might not otherwise ever think of they've ran, run a machine screw through that front panel and on the end of the machine screw they probably screwed down a coil spring okay that has one loop tilted up then the suspension spring for the tank itself runs straight across to that loop and hooks in okay now I'm assuming that you could adjust how far these springs are down or up on the machine screw to give you your distance your gap between the reverb tank and the um, vertical panel now once the cameras now see I can push down and lift it up and we're gonna see when I push down what happens there'll be rubber bumpers that will go against the springs and cage them okay now what makes it push down is let me back out of that zoom 
Okay, see this handle right here is out of the way. It's pulled back. It's very simple. It's two 90 degree bends with uh, slots that are about probably an inch to inch and a quarter long. Okay, and it can move backwards to allow the tank to float nicely on its suspension springs which is required for good reverb and then when it's time to move we're going to push this handle down and you see that and also when I put the little green felt in there it will push this down and now it's tight against the uh, front surface I'll remove the tank so that you can see what the rubber bumpers look like that are attached to this um, front panel okay so that's caged pull it up uncaged I've heard a couple audio demos of these units in which the people left them caged and it sounded horrible and it wasn't the unit's fault but some people don't realize that they have this internal feature to protect the transducers in the reverb tank uh, remember this one quit reverbing it may be the tank itself so we really need to pull it out take a look at it and when we do we'll get a good idea of how the little rubber bumpers look and how they function alright I've removed the two Phillips wood screws that hold the caging device in place and lo and behold there is an arched piece of sheet metal underneath to maintain tension on the unit because these wood screws have to have some slack in them to allow the unit to move back and forth this piece of um, sort of arched sheet metal then maintains a great deal of friction on the bottom of the caging unit and keeps it in place and from the looks of the lettering on that piece of sheet metal they cut it out of some tin can or, or something that they had um, it looks like it was lettered for another purpose that's kind of neat kind of quaint okay now let's go ahead and release our um, I'll, I'm going to remove these cables so there can be no harm and then we will uh, unleash our tank by releasing the four springs okay using some needle nose pliers I just unhooked the lateral springs from the very strong springs that are attached to the machine screws now the tank is ready to remove and we see that these are the foam bumpers that are going to push against the springs and keep them from thrashing around and self-destructing during transport you see they are rather crudely cut out and glued uh, on that front panel Okay, let's look in our tank some corrosion and I don't know that seems a little messy for a transducer it looks like glue or something spilled down here uh, it's not a lubricant or anything I don't know that's peculiar anything that sticks out like that needs to be checked but it would be nice if that's all that's wrong uh, one failed transducer keeping our reverb tank from working okay these are the transducers down here there uh, there's magnets uh, on either side of that hole and a little hook with a magnet in between and when the inner magnet vibrates within the outer magnets a slight electrical output is uh, created and therefore the as the springs vibrate from the music signal being applied to them they will wiggle the magnet of the transducer within the magnetic field and generate an output that will go to our amplifier okay we've got these tiny little coils here that uh, will allow us to match impedance uh, and those uh, have to be checked for continuity there's not much else you can do uh, there should be continuity between the two wires you see we've got a black wire and a green wire and uh, we have to be sure then by testing the continuity the black wire to the green wire that all the tiny little hair like wires in the uh, 
coil here are intact. Oh, and one more thing when we're looking in here, the, a subject uh, to debate on the uh, source of the reverb tanks for these. Um, many people, I believe, think that they're Accutronics tanks, but as you can see, they're made by Gibbs, and that's a subsidiary of Hammond. Hammond Organ Company, not Hammond Trans uh, Former Company. So um, they are in these blackface uh, units. It is definitely a Gibbs tank. Now that I have unlimited access to the tube chart, I'm going to uh, glue it down flat to protect it from any more damage and then try to glue in that missing piece so that it looks um, at least contiguous if not continuous with the body of the tube chart. And there's nothing magical about how I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm going to use a little tight bond tool, uh, glue, and probably put it on like a business card or something like that and slide it under the loose parts of the tube chart and then set something uh, heavy and flat on it to hold it down and let it dry. After all of this is glued down, I'll try to fit in that little missing chunk. And for glue applicators, I have found the perfect, perfect uh, solution. These are two tickets I was sent for a free steak dinner in which I can hear how they will invest all of my money. Okay, and uh, probably lose most of it. So these tickets will be used as glue applicators, okay, instead of tickets to the poorhouse. And you can see here I'm just using this bent card with some glue applied to it to rub the glue off underneath the tube chart and then apply weights to hold it down for it to dry. While we're waiting for the glue to dry, let's review the schematic for the original Fender 6G15. Now, you might look up this schematic on the internet and find a much more complex one for the reissue. Okay, this is the uh, schematic for the uh, original, the blackface. Now, as I said, if you look in the video description, uh, I have included a link to uh, show my modified version of this that has certain improvements which uh, I think you'll find very beneficial. Let's start off by looking at the power supply and as you can see it's half wave rectification. This sort of looks like the uh, triple diodes in series that you'll see like in a Bandmaster or um, a Baseman, one of the larger Fender amps but it's only one line of diode so it's half wave rectification. Uh, you'd have to have two lines of diodes to be full wave rectification. Now, uh, we feed that half wave rectification directly into a filter choke with a 40 at 450 on either side. Okay, this will be your smoothing um, right here in filtration. So then our hopefully nice clean 295 volts of B plus will come up this way. The straight 295 volts is going to go to what we can think of as the output transformer to drive the tank. We will have a 10k ohm voltage drop to this line which is going to feed the plates of the two, uh, if you will, preamp tubes. Okay, so that's the B plus power rail. Now in my uh, modified circuit I use a full wave bridge here which is going to give you a lot uh, smoother uh, output DC, but this will work just fine. We do have a third 40 microfarad filter cap at that junction to further smooth the B plus that's being fed into the plates of the preamp tubes. Now let's discuss the bulk of the reverb circuit. Uh, the guitar signal is input and at this point right here can take two different pathways. It can pass through the upper portion of the circuit and we will call that the wet signal or 
it can pass through the lower part of the circuit and be what we call the dry signal. It's interesting to see that we have a, a Y in the road right here and then we have a junction right here where the two signals are reunited at the mixer control. Now let's see what happens to the wet signal. Uh, it's going to be fed to the grid of a 12AT7 uh, where it will be amplified and then pass uh, down here through a coupling cap to the dwell control and as you can see this is a pretty standard looking volume control. Anytime you have an interstage pot like this that goes to ground it amounts to a volume control so the dwell is really the volume of the wet signal. Then the uh, amount of wet signal that you have selected with the dwell pot will come up here to the grid of the second stage of the 12AT7 where it will be amplified again before going through a coupling cap and being fed to the grid of the 6K6 output tube. And I think to simplify this in your minds, think of it as a Fender Champ single-ended amplification circuit. Okay, we have two stages of triode amplification before feeding a, uh, generally it's a 6V6 in our uh, Champ, but in this case a 6K6 output tube. We have an output transformer right here that will convert the uh, high voltage low current uh, present uh, here on the left side on the primary into high current low voltage to drive which in the champ would be an 8 ohm speaker but in this case it's an 8 ohm reverb tank. The uh, impedance here of the input of the tank is 8 ohms just the same as an 8 ohm speaker would appear to our little champ single ended circuit but instead of having uh, noise come out of a speaker instead we have a reverb augmented signal coming out of our tank into the grid of a uh, one triode of a 7025 okay so this will be its final stage of amplification before it's sent here to a tone control which operates like most passive tone controls in which it will send more or less of the high frequency uh, in the signal to ground and then what's left, what hasn't been sent to ground will go through uh, a very very low capacitance uh, cap here and come down to the mixing pot. Okay so we've seen that our wet signal comes in, goes through three stages of amplification, drives a reverb tank the output from the tank then is given uh, one stage of triode amplification and sent to the mixer. The dry signal however takes the easy way out and comes down here ignoring those three stages of amplification, ignoring the reverb tank and it comes into the second triode of that final 7025. Okay, it's fed into the grid and the output signal from that triode is taken from the cathode not from the plate and I'll explain to you in just a second why but what's really important is that the output signal passes through a coupling cap and comes up here to meet with the wet signal at the mixer now when we adjust the mixer as you can see this is the wiper of the mixer the little arrow if we crank the uh, little uh, potentiometer wiper up here will get all kinds of wet signal and almost no dry. If we move the mixer down here we'll get almost all dry signal and no. So you can sort of look at the mixer circuit like you do a water faucet uh, where you have a single handle faucet controlling hot water and cold water mixing them together to give you the temperature of water or in this case the amount of reverb that you want from your system. Now let's discuss why we take the wet signal from the plate of the upper triode of the 7025 and the dry signal from the cathode of the lower triode.
Let's start off by looking at the phase of the music signal that's being input. Uh, I've done a little quick waveform here and let's call this down up. Now we know that when we drive the grid of a tube that the signal on the plate is inverted. So when it comes out of this triode it's going to be up down, down up, up down, down up, and it will come down here to the uh, mixer control in a down up phase. Let's look at our signal that comes in here to the dry portion of our circuit. Down up, remains that way. And when we drive the grid, the signal on the cathode is not inverted. So it remains down up. Therefore, the wet signal and the dry signal, when they meet at the mixer, are in phase. They are in the same phase. If they were in opposite phases, they would cancel each other out. And you'd probably have very little output, of, if any. So the glue is dry on our tube chart, and I think it's time to start our repairs. Okay, that's the restored tube chart, and I just found what I think might be that tiny little missing nibble right along there. So I'm going to do my best to glue this in place. So there we go. That back margin is about 99% uh, restored, and uh, the tube chart is securely glued down and uh, should not be subject to any further damage. I mean, short of a nuclear holocaust. I think one thing that we have to do for sure is to replace the electrolytic filter caps. And I'm really excited uh, to get started working. And uh, it's strange, isn't it, that such a tiny little chassis like this has a doghouse like the much larger chassis do, but that's where the electrolytics are lurking. So let's unscrew the doghouse cover and see what type of caps we're going to need uh, to be uh, to replace. Before I pull the lid, I thought it was kind of interesting to look at the filter choke and the reverb uh, tank driver. Uh, the number on the tank driver agrees exactly with, with what TR2 is supposed to be. The number on the filter choke though, 125 uh, C3A, which is a fairly common filter choke number, and we see here that they say it's something else, 68319-A. Uh, but look at the dating on the two transformers 606 okay the there's no doubt about it this is the 1966 original um, filter choke okay so I think uh, I don't know this might have applied to some of these circuits but uh, on this particular one I believe the schematics incorrect now according to our schematic we should see one two three forty at 450 microfarad caps under the doghouse cover and that's exactly what we have found okay so uh, we're going to replace those and also uh, check the status of this resistor okay let's get started I can't help but marvel at the condition of the metal in this chassis. You can see the shadow there, the aging oxidation process uh, was uh, sort of uh, hampered here because it was underneath the doghouse lip, but you can see that this chassis is very close to looking exactly like it did on the day it was born. Okay, we'll get that bumper out of there and let's start removing these filter caps. And lest you suspect that we're replacing three wonderful, serviceable, original filter caps, look at the extrusion that's taken place and discoloration on this particular one. Um, I really think uh, for the future longevity of this device that it's no, there's no doubt that these need to be replaced. Now let's check the status of the transducers at either end 
of the original Gibbs reverb tank. Okay, I'm connected here to the output uh, transducer. We know that the output here from the tank is going to be uh, connected to the grid of the 7025 that provides the final stage of amplification. Now I know from experience on these uh, uh, tanks that the input end is rather low, generally around 8 ohms, as if this were a speaker, and the output end is a much higher impedance. Okay, so I expect a fairly high DC resistance, and we see here that it's 185.6 ohms of DC resistance in that coil right there. Now, that's going to translate to probably, I don't know, 20 to 2300 ohms of AC impedance. Okay, so we know then that this coil is intact and this transducer then is most likely quite functional. One thing we can't judge though with our uh, digital multimeters and uh, other measurement devices is the status of the magnetic field here in each of the little uh, magnetic wells that the arm connected to the spring is going to wiggle in to generate the output signal. Okay, um, that's really going to have to be by trial and error. So, since we know that the transducer at this end is okay, we'll have to check the other one. Then we'll have to uh, rebuild our circuit and then test the tank. And if the output uh, of the reverb is quite low, we might consider replacing the tank to get uh, fresher magnets here in the transducers. Um, or if it comes out just fine, then we're in good shape and we'll keep it. So let's go ahead then and connect up here and see what our low impedance end of the reverb tank, uh, if it has continuity and uh, what type of DC resistance it's showing. Okay, we're hooked on here uh, in the proper position and you see that the DC resistance is quite low uh, on the uh, input transducer. Here is the input to the tank and the output. Okay, we know that this little um, tank driving uh, output transformer uh, wants to see about 8 ohms here at this end and sure enough uh, we see that it's 1.3, 1 1.4 ohms of DC resistance which uh, will correspond I believe we'll find to about 8 ohms of AC impedance. Okay so it would appear then that our transducers are in good shape and as I said the magnetic field strength of the little uh, magnetic wells will have to be determined a little later. Well I did a little research on the internet on this um, reverb tank. Now this is a Gibbs tank but if you wanted to replace it or if you're building your 6G15 from scratch the tank you want is a mod 4AB3C1C tank. That's 8 ohms of input impedance, 2250 ohms output impedance. It's mounted vertically on that front wall of the uh, cabinet with the connectors, these connectors, on top. Okay, it's that specific. They even worry about whether the connectors are on top or the bottom. So, this is the exact tank you would want. Let's hope that ours, which did check out on our DC resistance readings, um, that this tank is going to work just fine and we can use it in the uh, with the finished circuit. Time to get started on these nasty old Mallory electrolytics. So let's go ahead and uh, clip or unsolder them from their positions and uh, replace them with brand new electrolytics. I'm going to try a little experiment on these old Mallory electrolytics. After I've uncrimped one end of the cardboard tube and pushed the aluminum capacitor out of that tube, I'm going to go over to my trusty bandsaw and cut off the head and tail 
of that aluminum capacitor and then use these to replace the aluminum cap with a brand new electrolytic uh, with an elect uh, a lead coming out of each end. Okay, I'll show you more as I pro progress. We'll see if this is even possible. Okay, I clipped off the lead from the rivet here on the positive end. Uh, I also scooped out all of the old black uh, electrolyte from inside so that now I have a nice clean insulated cap. I'm going to drill a very small diameter hole through the rivet to allow the lead from my new electrolytic cap to pass through. Here is the negative or grounded end of the uh, old cap and as you can see the electrolyte still here. I'll scoop it out. Alright, the ends now have the tiny little hole drilled to allow the passage of the leads uh, from the new electrolytic capacitor. Since this is the positive end here of the cardboard tube, I was careful to re reinstall the uh, insulated positive end from the original uh, electrolytic cap. Now I'm going to insert our new capacitor with the lead protruding out through that little tiny hole and then I'll be able to uh, reinstall the grounded end cap and uh, hopefully end up with a really original looking Mallory filter cap. Positive lead from the new capacitor is protruding through the positive end cap and now I'm going to stuff a little foam around this uh, new cap to hold it in place and then I'll reinstall the uh, negative ground cap. There you see the new capacitor is centered and stabilized with three strips of foam. Uh, I also uh, tried to uh, position it in the middle of the tube so that the leads on either end were the same length. Now it's time to install the negative cap and then uh, recrimp the tube. Well there's the finished product. Uh, the crimp isn't perfect on the negative side but it's pretty close. But uh, anyway now I'm ready to solder this one in and uh, repeat the same procedure with the other two uh, electrolytic filter caps. I couldn't resist soldering the first one in and you could admit that looks pretty darn original. I just wanted to briefly discuss the type of capacitor that I'm using in the 6G15. While I normally use uh, F and T caps they didn't offer the exact value that I needed which was 40 microfarads. MOD did offer that with an extra 50 volts of uh, DC tolerance. So I thought why not? Uh, they're fairly inexpensive and I've had really good luck with them in the past. Alright, I've finished um, all three of the original looking electrolytic caps are uh, soldered in place. I also am checking uh, this nodal resistor and it's within uh, 3% which is really wonderful for carbon comp resistors so I'm going to leave it. Okay so now it's time to put the cover on the doghouse and move uh, toward the uh, to the interior circuit. And before I install the lid here on the doghouse I'm going to put a little note in here to appease those of you who are worried that it's someday in the near future someone may go in here and say oh my god uh, time to replace these old electrolytics. Okay so uh, this should help uh, put your mind at ease. Well there you have it. Looks like new. Let's flip this jewel over and get to work on the internal circuit and the eyelet board. Well here's our chassis with the doghouse cover in place and uh, now it's time to deal with the circuit that's inside the chassis. Uh, you know looking at this right here remember that the owner said that there was no reverbing going on. What if it's the driving transformer that drives the tank? Let's flip it over and first thing we'll look at is is there continuity in both the primary and secondary of this reverb driving transformer. First side we'll check is the primary and it's coated with red and blue wires. We look at the schematic to see if, if there's any sort of shortcut 
that our uh, meter could take to give us a false reading. And as you can see, the primary simply goes to the plate of the 6K6, um, and the other end of the primary will go to the screen grid and to B+. Plus. So there's no way that we could get a false reading. And we see here that it's about 330 ohms. Okay, so now let's check the secondary winding to see if it has continuity. And here's a little tip for future use. Uh, on your schematic that you're going to keep in the file for this particular circuit, things like the uh, DC resistance of that winding are never included, but you can write them down. Okay, you see here that I've put down the uh, resistances that can be found, the, the proper uh, ID of the reverb tank, things like this that will help me in the future. So uh, next time I get one of these in, uh, I can check the reverb driver transformer and know what the proper DC resistances are for uh, each of the winding. And on the secondary winding, a much lower DC resistance, as you might expect, uh, with a reading of about 1.3 ohms. Okay, I have uh, my two test probes connected properly and I've written down that value uh, for future reference and I know now that the uh, reverb driver transformer is fully functional. One other consideration is we know that in some Fender amps for the tremolo to work you have to have a foot switch plugged in and in the proper uh, switch position. Okay, well, who knows, maybe uh, in this case we have to have a foot switch for the reverb to work. Well, let's look up here. Here comes our reverb signal, and we see that we take a little side route here. We plug in our foot switch, and the foot switch is simply to ground our signal. So by looking at this, it's not part of any sort of uh, a circuit at where its presence is necessary. Uh, it's purely optional, and whether or not we have it plugged in will make no difference. So we can eliminate that as the source of the problem. So let's open up the tube box. You see them in their swaddling clothes here, uh, just sleeping happily in the manger of a bubble wrap. Um, now I've said in previous videos it's almost never the tubes. Everybody uh, immediately when something quits working they start running off and buying new tube sets. It's rarely ever a tube but you still have to rule that out because you're going to feel pretty silly if you replace every component in the entire circuit and it still doesn't work and it turns out it was just a bad tube. So let's get out the trusty Hickok tube tester test these three jewels and make sure that they're functional. First off our 12 AT7 everything's set up I've already checked for shorts there are none um, so let's push our button wow that's about as good as it gets okay now we have to check the second triode of the 12 AT7. I've set the tube tester now for the second triode and wow pegs the meter as good as it gets okay so I think we can rule out the 12 AT7 as being the source of any problems now it's time for the 6K6 the tube that actually drives the reverb tank uh, I've cranked all of these adjustments into the tube tester I've checked for shorts and um, I've also uh, made sure the line voltage is correct let's push pin 4 Eh, no problem. That's a perfectly good 6K6. Now, uh, everything hangs on the final tube, the last stage of amplification, the 7025. We're all set up now for the first triode of the 7025, and uh, all the other tests have been performed. It looks perfectly fine. Now we'll test the second triode. Here goes no problem at all. So, as I have said so many times, um, it's rarely a tube. And a lot of people when they get started on repairing amps, they say, oh, I must go buy a tube tester. Uh, and I'm telling you, I don't use it that often. And as you can see, it's, it's rarely the issue. 
it would be a lot cheaper and easier for you just to simply maintain a stock of common tubes and substitute a, a known good 12 AT7 for, for this one. See if that helps. A known good 6K6. Does it work? Or 7025, which is really just a glorified 12AX7. So um, I really think that a tube tester is one of those things you could live without. Um, it makes you feel better. Get one by all means. They're not cheap. But um, as you've seen, it really is it's very rare that the tube is the issue. Next thing to check, and I think far more likely than a tube issue, are the cables. Um, these cables sometimes go through um, a lot of uh, bending and, and flexing and, and other problems, and they develop internal breaks. Another thing that happens is corrosion develops inside the little tulip here, and you don't get good continuity with your ground. So uh, if you notice, these are nice and clean and shiny. If they're not, you can take like a scotch bright or something like that and polish them up. But uh, let's check the continuity from the tip of our cable to this connection right here uh, for our transducer. Make sure that the cables have good continuity. Also, while I'm testing the continuity, I'm going to move the cable around to make sure I don't have some intermittent break. Then the second thing I'll check for continuity is between the little tulip shield and the uh, signal carrying prong. Um, I'm going to unplug them from the tank to do that. Uh, because we don't want your transducer coils giving you false continuity readings. And there should be no continuity. If there is, there's a short. And there goes your signal. Okay, it's going to ground. So, let's go ahead then and test our cables. Okay, I'm all set up here. And uh, the first test will be for the left-hand cable. And I'm connecting my test probe to the prong on the cable. And then I'm connecting it to the socket that receives the prong down here in the jack that's on the tank and as you can see it's very close to zero ohms which is exactly what you'd expect okay now let's test the right hand cable and see what we get same setup on the right hand cable and as you see down pretty low okay pretty close to zero there might be a fraction of an ohm resistance in the jumper cables I'm using in my test probe cables uh, etc but obviously if there's any signal being applied to that tip it's gonna make it in here to the transducer okay now I'm gonna measure the uh, if continuity exists between the prong and the shield and as you can see, there is no internal short in this particular cable. But, let me wiggle it around a little bit just to be sure. And I just don't see any intermittent shorts. Okay, let's try the other. Okay, once again, shield to prong. No continuity whatsoever. And I'm flexing the cable. Okay, so the cables check out. And I'm telling you, way more often are the cables at fault than the tubes okay so it's a really a legitimate consideration so now we verified that the transducers are in good shape that the cables are uh, fine no shorts uh, no problems with them uh, we have uh, checked the uh, reverb driving transformer and both of the windings are just fine we've I looked at the schematic and we can tell we do not need a foot switch to make this thing work. We have brand new electrolytic capacitors. Uh, we're kind of running out of issues here. Okay, so uh, I guess next, um, let me replace the cord with a good three prong chassis grounding cord. And then let's go ahead and plug the tubes into this jewel and start testing and checking. Okay, to see uh, if there is some place or some component in the circuit that's malfunctioning. I tested the diodes and they all seem to check out okay, but they sure look like they've been overheated. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and replace them with uh, much larger diodes uh, just to play it safe. I don't think that's what's wrong with this, but uh, it will certainly keep uh, that from being an issue any time in the future. Just to correlate what I'm doing to the schematic, uh, those are the three diodes in series, uh, so typical of a fender uh, solid state rectification between the B plus and the filter choke. Okay, so we're going to replace those three jewels right there. All right, I removed the diodes. Uh, you notice this is the B plus end, this is the filter choke end, and as you look at them, the band is always on the filter choke end of the diode. B plus comes in here, bands on the far end, far end, far end, and then it goes to the filter choke. What that tells us is only the positive waveforms of the AC coming out of the high voltage winding of the power transformer will be able to pass. Okay, so if only the positive can pass, then we will end up with a positive DC current flowing to the filter choke. And that's why we call it B+. I've occasionally been criticized by viewers uh, for using um, much larger diodes than the circuit might call for. Um, in this case, it's a 1N5408, uh, which is 1,000 volts and 3 amps, which is, what, about 30 times what the circuit needs. But these are the only ones I have on, on hand in which I have three matching diodes. So. Uh, it's going to get them, overkill or not, these are going in. There are the three mega diodes uh, wired in series and properly biased. Um, now I think it would be interesting to plug the tubes into this jewel, plug it into the current limiter and see if uh, we can figure out what's wrong with it. It may work just fine, that would be nice, but if not uh, we really need to have it uh, operating for us to test different points in the circuit to see uh, where the failure is occurring. Here's the setup for the initial testing. I've got the 6G15 plugged into its original Gibbs tank oriented vertically with the connectors on top as it should be in the cabinet and uh, my output is going to a little fender bullet amp. Now when we do the final audio testing of course I'll use a much better amp but for now this is going to give us an idea of whether or not the unit is working and uh, what's the state of the magnetism in our Gibbs tank. Okay so uh, I'm going to uh, just hit some staccato chords with different settings uh, here on the dwell the uh, mixer and the tone and we'll see how they sound and then I will install a brand new mod tank in place of the Gibbs tank and repeat the test exactly and then what I'll do is I'll put the Gibbs and then the mod so we'll have A, B, A, B, A, B testing uh, at each of the settings. So you can uh, very quickly make a judgment about what you think about the depth uh, and tone.
Well, I think that even with the suboptimum camera microphone, uh, the difference between the two tanks is very obvious. The mod tank uh, has a much lusher, fuller uh, reverb uh, tone, whereas the original Gibb tank seems very weak and um, kind of tinny to me. Uh, and not a pleasant sound, and I really think that has to do with the uh, little Alnico magnets in the spring transducers losing their magnetic strength. So what I'm going to do is check with the owner of this unit and see if he'd like me to order the proper uh, vertical mount mod uh, replacement uh, spring reverb tank for his uh, 6G15. Okay, so uh, we'll see what he says, and I will proceed based on that outcome. I'm telling you, Mitzi's turning into the best workshop cat in the universe. I was uh, working busily here and not giving her enough attention, so she jumped right up here between me and the 6G15 chassis and said, rub my back. What a girl. Good girl. It's been years since any girl ever jumped up on the workbench and said, rub my back. Good girl. It's always exciting when you're trying to solder and a cat's tail keeps flashing before your eyes. But I'll find a way around it. Okay, since I'm going to have to order a new mod tank, like this, the black one here at the top, um, to replace the original Gibbs tank, it occurred to me, and I've done this in the past on fender amps, is rather than replace the entire tank, why not transplant the new transducers from the mod tank into the Gibbs tank? Also notice how saggy one of the springs is. We'll also transplant our new uh, little uh, more taut uh, springs. So what I have to do is drill out the rivet that holds the original transducers into the Gibbs tray and it looks like I'm going to be able to unscrew the Accutronics transducers and then just install them here and solder the connections to the output jacks. Okay, so uh, I really think that would be better than almost the entire tank is original. It would look completely original other than the, these white plastic transducers, which I know are, are just jarring to the eye, but uh, it'd be so nice if they were brass like these, but they aren't. So that will be the only visible uh, clue that some transplant has taken place. For those of you who are thinking, well, and why don't you just transplant the Accutronics tray, this subunit here, into the Gibbs tank, and that's not possible because look at where the steady pins are located on the Gibbs, and then they're in a completely different position here in the Accutronics tank. Now, this particular mod tank is not the exact model that we need. Uh, it is not a 4AB3C1C, so I'm going to order one of those because it will have the transducers arranged uh, so uh, for vertical mount rather than horizontal mount like these are. Okay, so I'm going to go order uh, a new tank, and then uh, meanwhile I'm going to re uh, remove the transducers from the old Gibbs tray. Okay, step one, I have uh, unsoldered the leads that connect the transducer to the RCA uh, jacks on either side of the tank. Now it's time, and this is not that easy, to disconnect the suspension springs from the holes on the side of the tray. It's hard to do without deforming the end of the spring, but uh, we'll do our best. After struggling for about 10 minutes with needle nose pliers, I made a quick tool here out of an old uh, Phillips screwdriver. Um, just a tiny little hooked end. Uh, loop it through where the final coil is holding uh, around the side of the tray and just gently pull the end of the spring around to where the whole thing can pop through the hole on the side of the tray. 
easier said than done I guess but once I made the tool uh, I had all four springs out in less than a minute. Now we remove the suspended tray from inside of the um, reverb tank housing and uh, I'm going to release the springs from the transducers and then start drilling out the rivets. Let's see if this one's a little better lit up. Yes, the rivet down there that holds the plastic transducer to the tray surface. Okay, the springs are removed. There's actually four springs, but uh, they're soldered together at their junction here in pairs. You notice that there is one long spring, that was the saggy one, and one shorter spring. Now we can drill out the rivets that are holding the transducer bodies in position. Well, I very carefully drilled the head off of each of the rivets that's holding the transducers in place. So now I'm just going to uh, lift them off and pop out the rivets and we'll be waiting then for the delivery of our new mod uh, tank with brand new transducers and springs. There you have it. The old transducers have been completely separated from the suspended uh, tray and um, if you notice the little coils are coated differently, one for high impedance, one for low impedance. Remember it was at 2250 at the output and 8 ohms on the input. Okay, so um, now we'll just set these aside. We've got our rivets and our little uh, clamps there if we need them. If anybody ever wanted to try to restore the tank, there's everything there for them to do it. Well, two days passed and Here's our new mod tank, the appropriate model uh, for the 6G15. And here is the Gibbs tank. So uh, now I'm going to unsolder the transducer leads uh, from the RCA uh, plugs here at either end. And then unscrew and liberate the transducers from this tray. As I said earlier, the reason I have to do that is that the uh, tray uh, holes for those steady pins are in two different positions unfortunately okay so let's get started all right I've uh, unsoldered the transducer wires from the RCA uh, sockets at either end and uh, now I have to liberate the tray here from the four suspension springs so that I can get at the screws that are holding the transducers in place on the tray. Okay, the four suspension springs were disconnected from the holes in the corners of the tray and the tray has been released. Now I can uh, flip it over and see uh, about unscrewing the, it looks like, sheet metal screws here that are holding the transducers to the tray. Okay, I've turned the mod tank tray over and we see that yes indeed there is a small Phillips head screw holding each of the transducers to the tray. But another problem arises and that is that there's buttons on the transducer to locate it to keep it from uh, twisting and those buttons are in a completely different position than the holes on the uh, Gibbs tray. So uh, I'm going to have to figure out uh, a way to get around that. I removed the little Phillips head screws and removed the transducers from the tray. If you're wondering why I didn't release the springs, it's because they're epoxied in place in each of the little transducer uh, magnet arms. So uh, another complication, but I don't think there's any issue as long as I handle it very carefully. Now we're going to have to come up with a way to make this transducer fit on this tray. So what I've done is duplicate this triangular uh, screw hole uh, pattern on the Gibbs tray so that now the mod transducers will uh, fit in uh, to the two holes with their locating pins and I can use the uh, little Phillips screw to hold it in place. 
And now before I install the transducers uh, in the Gibbs tray, uh, I really liked the snazzy grommets that a mod uses. Uh, and so I uh, got some large black, uh, so fairly soft rubber grommets for the Gibbs tray. Okay, give it a little plusher uh, look and it won't be banging around on those locating uh, studs. Okay, here you see the uh, mod transducer has been installed. The two locating pins are protruding through those uh, drilled holes and the Phillips screw is holding it uh, very snugly against the tray. Time to do now the other end. And now the left hand transducer has been installed. Uh, it's a little more challenging than the right hand because I had to stretch the springs. Uh, but there it is. Uh, next I'm going to clean all my fingerprints off the back of this tray and then uh, prepare to install it in the original Gibbs shielding tank. Okay, I've resuspended the uh, reverb plate here uh, with the springs within the tank and uh, it's got some good free suspension movement. Uh, now let's uh, solder the transducer wires back to the RCA uh, sockets and uh, I think we'll be done. Both of our transducers are properly wired to their respective RCA sockets and I believe now that our tank is complete. Well time for the final test before our audio uh, demonstration. Uh, we've got our rebuilt Gibbs tank plugged into our equally rebuilt 6G15 circuit. And before I put this all back in the cabinet uh, and get Jack and Ollie uh, up from their catnip uh, stupor, I wanted to make sure that the tank was working right. Okay, uh, also I'm going to do one other little added test and there is some argument about which is the best output tube for a 6G15. Uh, it came originally with a 6K6 which is relatively low output tube. Some people prefer a 6V6 in the output position. So what I'll do is we'll not only verify that the tank is working properly by going through various settings and strumming a few chords, uh, kind of staccato chords to, to really let us hear the reverb. And I will do uh, one a strum set at 6K with a 6K6, one with a 6V6. So you'll get another A, B, A, B, a way to compare not only how the tank works and the new circuit works, but also how the two different output tubes work. And in each case, you can look here for the label to see which output tube is in place. Okay, so let's get started. Well, there you have it. I think the tank uh, with those new transducers is working absolutely perfectly. Uh, as to the preference for the 6K6 or 6V6 tank driving um, tube, I uh, leave that up to you. It's purely subjective. Some people prefer one. I tend to prefer the 6V6 because being uh, an old reverb hound at heart, I'd rather have too much 
reverb available and crank down a little rather than not quite have what I need and have to crank up. Okay, so that's just my own rationalization. I'm sure you'll have your own opinion that you can share with us in the comments section. But I think it's quite obvious that the 6V6 tube is considerably more powerful than the 6K6 and drives the tank considerably harder. Now with that said, let's button all of the components up at, back in the original cabinet. We'll go get uh, Ollie and Jack uh, up from their catnip stupor, get them tuned up and ready for a nice audio demo. Uh, I'll also be using the SM57 microphone which is going to give you a much better fidelity uh, idea of how the tank sounds and I'm also going to do some audio uh, demo tunes with the 6V6 tube uh, just so that you can see get a, a good a high fidelity uh, idea of how it sounds. Okay, so if that uh, seems tolerable, uh, pull up an easy chair and uh, we'll be right back. Well, it's finally time for our audio demonstration of the uh, Fender 6G15 reverb tank. Um, I, instead of the Fender Bullet, uh, I've decided to go with one of my own uh, hand built amps in this case. It's a Hammond uh, AO35 conversion. I'll put a link in the video description uh, which will take you to the original video that featured this amp so that you can see all the details. Here's a rear view of the uh, amplifier showing the AO35 chassis nestled here on the floor and the very special completely original vintage Jensen uh, C12Q speaker. Okay, original cone, everything about the speaker is original from 1968 and hopefully it will give a really nice uh, vintage flavor to our reverb audio demonstration. My plan is to have Ollie and Jack play several tunes for us uh, at different adjustment levels here on the uh, 6G15 uh, and then uh, at the end we'll have several AB comparison tunes uh, in which we will have the uh, 6K6 versus 6V6 uh, tone competition. To ensure the best possible fidelity uh, for our audio demo tunes they will all be recorded using our SM57 microphone. If that sounds at all interesting, pull up an easy chair and get ready because we're just about to begin.
Well, I guess that's about it for this bodacious video featuring the mighty 1966 Fender 6G15 standalone reverb tank. As is customary, I wanted to take a few moments to personally thank all of our PayPal contributors and Patreon patrons for their generous continued support of our channel, keeping us on the air for another month. If you would like to join them in supporting our channel and uh, fostering the production of more videos like this one, uh, I will put links in the video description to assist you to do so. Also, I'd like to make just a few final announcements here. Number one, I'm sure that some of you are uh, in terror that I will allow little Mitzi to jump up on the counter and get electrocuted okay while I'm working on an amp and I can assure you that that will not happen okay and the the pictures that you saw uh, during the video uh, the amp was unplugged and of course uh, I will never allow her to get in harm's way at any time second I left out uh, some of the uh, testing and repairs that were done on the eyelet board components simply uh, because I've already shown uh, that testing procedure over and over again and uh, just to keep the video at even a halfway reasonable limit uh, certain things had to be left out I tried to focus on things that were new and interesting and I hope that I uh, made the right choices that said uh, just a final uh, hearty thanks to all of our loyal viewers for joining us and uh, we hope to see you again in future videos. Until then, stay happy and healthy and stay tuned.